over the evening. Got the time of day right this time. Well, like last week, last time I was here. And you see, I'm bringing out the big guns with the computer instead of the iPad. So, regardless of that, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you now. Thank you for this day that you've given to us. Father, I pray that as we enter this time of devotion to your word, I pray that you will open up our hearts and our minds to the things that will be presented this evening. And I pray that these things will be shared among those that we come in contact with this week. Father, I pray that if I do teach anything wrong, I pray that you would defeat me. But not only that, but lead me to learn more so that I can teach your word more accurately and more simply. Father, I pray you'll be with each and every one of us. Give us the mindset and open hearts and open minds and let your light shine through us. And Father, when you do call us home to be with you for eternity, I pray you grant for us a peaceful passing from this life. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you could tell from the infographic behind me, if we had that up, we would be looking at the Good Shepherd tonight. Now, I'm sure this topic it has been taught or preached many times over, whether here at Waters or wherever else you may be from. But I'm of the mindset that it's good to revisit these things as, as we spiritually mature in our walk and we dig a little deeper, more than a moment, as we dig under the surface of these things that we may have heard of VBS or Children's Bible Hour, we can yield new information that we may have overlooked or not understood at that earlier age. But before we dive into the Word, and we're beginning the 23rd Psalm, so I invite you to turn your Bibles there, please. A bit of context as to why the term shepherd is used, and the gravity of that in the biblical times. Now, unless you were born and or raised on a farm, like I'm sure not a, a lot of us were, I'm sure we don't complete, have a complete grasp on or the weight of what the shepherd does. And while we may have shepherds in the church, those being the elders, they only give a small glimpse of the weight that the biblical and actual shepherds you see out there in the Great Plains have in terms of his responsibilities to their flock. Any good shepherd is going to stay with their flock 24 hours a day, 8 days a week. And no, I did not misspeak, I mean 8 days a week. Yeah, if you chuckle some that, thank you. They will stay with that flock, not just to give comfort or direction, whether that be to a new food source or back to their original pen, but also to protect that flock from the outside villains or predators that the sheep face. And we see something like something along those lines with David, a pretty well-known character, I think, in the Bible. And before he was made king by Samuel, he was a shepherd himself. That was where he was at whenever Samuel was looking to the next king. He was doing his shepherding duties. And one of his feats, if you want to put it that way, while protecting the flock that he was assigned to, was defeating, you know, your everyday lion. Nothing, nothing too bad. Nothing more than a staff or a glorified stick they found. And on top of that, as we know, he went up against Goliath and defeated him with nothing more than a few pebbles he found on the nearby riverbed and a slingshot. David gave everything to make sure that the flocks under his care, whether that be actual sheep or, oh, I don't know, the entirety of Israel, was safe. And we still see that today with a modern-day shepherd out in the Great Plains. Now, while they don't have to face a 10-foot-tall man every other day or go up against your run-of-the-mill lion or great bear in the Great Plains of Oklahoma, they still give direction and protection to the flock they oversee. And we also apply this to the eldership, who guides and protects the spiritual flock that God has put them in, under the care of, guiding them to the ultimate goal of seeing each other 
behind the pearly gates of heaven, and protecting it, in the meanwhile, from the outside influences of this world. And with that context out of the way, let's take a look at the 23rd Psalm, one of the many of which David wrote. According to the New King James Version, the Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though, through, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me, before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And... I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And keep your Bibles handy. We see that a similar sentiment in the 10th chapter of John's account of the gospel, all in the other half of the Bible, starting in verse number 11 is where we'll be taking a look at. And while the previous 10 verses of this chapter also deal with shepherding, I think, starting at verse 11, going through verse 16, we see something along the lines of the Lord being the shepherd. And this is Jesus talking, by the way, by the way in those red letters that we all love. Also, according to New King James Version, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling... He who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I, Jesus, am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. I'm sure we all know that there are various congregations around with different buildings and different locations, different personnel makeup of those congregations. But regardless of all that, we are called to be unified as one body of Christ, one collective flock. Regardless of whether one church says that they want nothing in common to do with another one, even though they're just a New York block away down the road, we are called by Jesus to be one. This is something that Paul wrote to a church in Rome, as I'm sure some of us recall going through the book of Romans of the past 160 plus weeks. Not to throw anyone on the bus for that. But in the 14th and 15th chapters of that letter, he talks about being unified with, with each other in love and in spirit, something that I'm sure is still relevant to the church today. And no matter what the world says outside of these four walls, we have the answers to this thing that I like to call the open note test that we call life. It's called the, will, the living word of God. It's right in front of us, so we might as well use it. We are called to use it. I'm sure we have the teacher in school who's, who's like, well, I want this class to be as easy as possible because you're not going to use half the stuff I teach anyway. That's why I have all my tests to be open book, open notes. I would rather you pass this, pass this class and use the notes that I give you rather than failing a test over a subject that you ain't going to use outside this class or outside the school. 
Now, while we are going to use a little more than half the stuff that's in the Bible, which is pretty plain, the same logic still applies. The answers are right there. Read it, learn from it, and yield new information, like I said at the top. It's good to revisit these things. Especially the things we hear at VBS or in Children's Bible Hour because as we mature both physically and spiritually and we live out new life experiences and see new things, that has an impact on how we see or how we interpret what God's Word says. Thus bringing up 1 Corinthians 13 when Paul writes in verse 11, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childless things. Now, while we may remember this chapter for it being known as the love chapter, this verse here is still applicable in the fact that we should not only be maturing physically, as I hope we all do, but spiritually as well. And while we, do, while we should go back and dig a little deeper, and I know why Quentin Dizzy, please don't sue us, we no longer scrape the surface of those stories, but start to get the complex meaning of what God truly meant for those verses to mean. Now I'm going to pose a question, and I would like to, a show of hands for, this, for an answer. Who in this room has the Bible completely memorized and perfected cover to cover? I don't. A lot of us don't, as can, can be seen. And that's okay. Thank goodness we don't have to have the perfect record or give a perfect one-for-one -one match of what the Bible says in 119 Psalm, verse number 154, to enter the pearly gates. If that was the case, I would surely not make it, because mm -hmm, I have a lot to learn about that. However, that said, while only having a surface-level understanding of, let's say, the fruits of the Spirit was perfectly acceptable at a young age, that ain't, that's not going to work for spiritual, spiritual maturity. The more we dig into these things, the more we grasp that leads to spiritual maturity. And I know what you're thinking. At least I hope I know what you're thinking, because that's how I'm going to lead into this. What analogy is going to bring to the table this time? Now, I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard the saying, or something along the likes of, oh, that car there is a lemon. If not, well, now you have. You're welcome. And you might be asking yourself, Stephen, what in, in the world does a lemon have to do with this? It's a fruit, something that has citrus in it. What does a, what does a lemon that produce, makes you puffer up like a pucker, puffer fish, what does that have to do with this? Well, if you think about it through the automotive world, a lemon is known as either a new car that was made at closing time on one particular Friday before a three-day weekend, and people are like, just push this thing out. Who cares if they put enough Loctite on that one bolt to screw in the transmission housing? Let's just get this thing done. I want to go home. I want to see the big game. And or a car, truck, or SUV that is cons consistently in the shops being fixed by a mechanic or dealer every other weekend because something always goes wrong with it. Well, in a way, we're all limited to the fact that we've all sinned, right? And the sins that we commit or have committed in our lives can be applied as those issues with that car you just bought off of CarMax two days ago. Whether it be a head gasket that blows every other mile just because it's not never been sealed right or not smoothed down, or a pinhole lake that causes you to lose oil everywhere even though we just topped it off just yesterday. The sins we commit are those issues, are those faults, and if it weren't for the perfect sacrifice of Jesus, the fact that the good book says that the wages of sin is death from Romans 6.23, 
and that we all fall short of the glory of God, paraphrasing Romans 3.23, we're all doomed from the, from the metaphorical strapper's torch with no shot of even being considered to fix. However, thank the Lord God that he sent his son, the perfect spotless lamb, to die for each and every one of us. And because of that sacrifice, we have access to and the opportunity to be fixed by a cube. It's an ornament of the world again. Be fixed by the best mechanic ever known to man, and no one can top that. And with that knowledge, and the Bible being your metaphorical how-to guide, and I fix a kit, there is no issue that cannot be fixed. Thank you, amen, for that. I went out of order. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> but in all of this, to be of this one unified flock, we have to be unified as one body, one mind, one idea. We can't be bickering over whether or not the green bee casserole was supposed to be at, at this table or at this table at the potluck or anything. Because if, if someone who, is, who needs Christ comes in through those, four, th th through those doors and they see us at each other's throats just because someone didn't bring the right recipe for the banana pudding, how on earth did they expect us to be unified or show them the one true way? Because if they see that, they're going to be under the impression of, hmm... If they argue about that and they or at each other's throats about something that insignificant in the grand scheme of things, what happens when something when someone comes along and has a different understanding of something more drastic in the grand scheme of things? Like if they believe that baptism is necessary. And if they see that, and they have a question, if they see something that small tearing people apart, tearing brothers and sisters apart, what chance do we have to offer them the chance to come be part of the flock here or the grand flock around? Throughout all of this, unity... Is, is a little underlying theme. Being unified at the church body here, being unified with one ultimate goal, and being unified with all the brethren around this great world. And we have to lift each other up whenever things go a little south, as I'm sure we all know. Because things do. This is life, after all, is not is not a simulation. You can't undo something you did ten years ago to make sure it doesn't affect you in the today. And in order to really make sure that we're doing what the Lord Lord's work is, unity has to be one of the things at the forefront of our minds, that with love. Because without love, then what, what's the true, what's, why are we doing it? And so as we do every, every Sunday, morning and evening, we like to offer an invitation. If you have something you need that's on your hearts, that you're like prayers for, whether publicly or in private, you have the opportunity. Whether you would like to work and worship with us here at Waters Road and place membership in this portion of the Grand Flock, we'll be more than happy to work and worship with you. Or if tonight is the night that, the, that God has put in your heart to put away the old self and put on the new self, 
in his blood and join the flock of God. What better night than tonight? Whatever the need may be, the opportunity is now. Please come as you stand and sing. Thank you.